This is your News from Underground from the place here in Richmond, which will provide the most consistent anarchist news or fun out there on the internet. Uh, Co host today is Arizona and Phil. And we're going to continue with wonderful stories that most of you are probably keeping up with today. Uh, first one we're going to talk about is the Panama Papers. So, Panama Papers, what are they? So, the Panama Papers are a, it's a dump of documents, banking transactions, identities, cookbooks, accounts, shell company records. Uh, that all have been funneled through a financial asset management company in the Panama. Uh, one, of the, one of the key things to note of these papers is that a lot of public figures have been indicted in terms of like, using this company to store lots and lots of money in financial assets so that they don't have to pay taxes on them. Uh, and they're primarily the ones, uh, these public figures are the ones telling you that you should pay your taxes. So, first, first one on the chopping block is Prime Minister Winters. Prime Minister Sigmund David Gunkelson, uh, Prime Minister of Iceland, I probably am butchering his name, uh, said, he, said he would stand chairman as a progressive party, but tap on Sigurd Ingi Johansson to be the next Prime Minister. He resigned from his position as Prime Minister because of, because of allegations that he had assets in excess of Four million hiding in these accounts, and that's not even counting. Um, that's not counting the assets that he has in stocks, bonds, uh, and hidden away in other banks that are associated with this firm. How many of you people that they found? Because like, there's like what over a million documents have been released, right? Uh, out of those that you found uh, or looked into, how many have been revealed to be of Americans? So, I think. The one that was reported that there were 200 uh, low-level American businessmen um, that had accounts in, uh, to hide away and to escape taxes. But I was actually kind of surprised that there was, I didn't see any uh, big, like big American politician names come out. Uh, well, this is, uh, this is touted as the biggest leak ever, ever, ever. So, <laughs> uh, I, I would imagine that there's probably quite a bit of information here that actually hasn't been gone through yet. Yeah, it's so. huge. It's ridiculously huge. But the other thing that's also interesting to note is that the ICIJ, or this international council uh, that, um, that does this journalism, is actually funded by the Department of Justice in the, from the United States. Mm. So, it, you know, Without going too far into like, oh, conspiracy land, I will say that, well, it does kind of cast a little bit of, uh, of doubt as to like why American names haven't shown up. I would find it to be that, uh, of course, there are many other tax havens, right, out there in the world. Uh, this is probably the, um, the one most people got blow jangled into believing it would work. Because here on the Western sphere of the Americas, you have an enormous amount of government spying agencies that knows what is going on, especially in Panama. So, of course, uh, given that, American investors would know the insights for your pay. This is not a good place to go. I'll let the other ones kind of take the, the fall for it and just kind of go into there. we got better places for you to have your money. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I would imagine that might be a particular reason why there's not a lot of American investors there uh, versus a lot of the political ones in the Eastern part of the European theater, but just thinking that. Yeah, well, I think uh, I think most of the Americans are going to our, uh, uh, like Switzerland and uh, Canada. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, that's actually what uh, what surprised me. Uh, actually, there's a lot of banks that were that were involved in this. Like, there's a lot of actually big European uh, banks that were named, uh, and that were the ones transferring the funds. Illegal, like illegally, or just transferring the funds and managing them, bouncing them from different places, um, so that they couldn't be tracked very easily. And the biggest one is the British HBC, HSBC Bank, that had like twenty three hundred, that owned twenty three hundred of the shell companies that were used to transfer and manage these funds. Yeah, wow. uh, the, the the next big one is UBS, which had eleven hundred. Uh, of these of these shell companies, and then there's other ones like Mossad Fonseca and Societe Generale, and then the Royal Bank of Canada, and then Credit Suisse. Like these are these are supposed to be really respected European banks. Oh, of course. 
I, it seems surprising to me that there isn't that there isn't an American bank. Mm. Um, but it's not like these banks don't do business with American banks either. Right. Mm. Like I don't know how how big. Absent. Yeah, like how big or mm-hmm. how far does it go up the chain of command in terms of like who owns what accounts in that company? I don't know. But some of these accounts didn't have like paltry sums of money. Well, yeah. <sighs> Yeah, so I, I would conclude that these people just got Shanghai, or maybe these people uh, maybe did not uh, adhere towards uh, the IMF or other interesting banking standards or kind of black note or some kind of crazy scenario. It's like, well, because this information is not typically new. I'm pretty sure this information has been around for years now, and now it's just uh, putting pressure on it to kind of be released. So, as an example, for the 2% versus the 1% of the world. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm I'm somebody that actually I mean I I tend to kind of shy away from really heavy conspiracies, but really this is kind of one of those things that's like a very a somewhat narrow area of, of of people are sort of implicated in this. You know, <laughs> I mean, they're all of the mainstream media is trying to take this out to be you know. Putin is hiding all of his money, and, and Putin isn't even himself really particularly implicated. You know, his friends are, right. but Putin himself isn't, you know, there's no evidence actually definitive against him. Uh, so one, there was actually a case, one of, so this was a case, in Mexico there's a lot of corruption, and the favorite contractor of Enrique Peña Nieto, which is the current president over there, uh, it turns out that a lot of, he also managed funds through uh, through this firm. Uh, they they were managing the funds that he was getting for, through his contracting firms and putting it off into the shell company and then managing it there so that they they would pay less taxes. Well, again, that goes to our two interesting points that the, a lot of the political rulers, like the prime minister of Iceland, realizing that taxation while well, I mean, the property they do not want to be. Uh, Redistributed. Maybe right? taxation. Uh, well, there we go. Because otherwise, they realize that yeah, redistribution is a great thing, and you would not hide your money. Right? Right. So how dare these people escape? You know, taxation. That, that that's really that's really the focus here. How dare these people escape that? I mean, taxation. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's not that this is complete corruption. You know, from these officials that are stealing from so many people, but you know. I don't want to deal with that myself. Just, you know, it laws for you, not for me. Right. And the banking institutions are completely complicit with this. Oh, of course. Of I course they are. That's what I would say in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, aside from like tax savings, like who wouldn't want to hide the property when you know these are coming and knocking on your door? Right. right. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's one of the, the biggest things that really bugs me is that tax evaders to me are are the prime example of people that are escaping the most corruption. You know, people who are evading taxes, and I mean legitimately, not, not, not you know, uh, not politicians who are evading taxes, that they are evading themselves. Yeah. yeah. But I've had, you know, I... You mean like in an average marketplace? Right. I mean, people that are like in... Like being just, under the table. Just businessmen that are trying to escape, that are trying, you know, moving elsewhere so that they don't have to to deal with this oppressive tax regime that we have in, in America. And, and one of the most bothersome things I have, you know, I have, I have very good friends that speak to me that are like, you know, these people are the scum of the earth because they, they leave to, to escape these tax these taxes. It's like, why is it wrong to avoid theft? Yeah. Uh, you know, but that's, to me, that's, you know, a lot of people are, are looking at the Panama Papers and, and really saying, how dare these people escape these taxes? But it's really, it's, it's not about that. It's about corruption. It's about these, this, you know, laws for you and not for me. It's, you know, we, you must not escape taxes. These are, these are only for you. We will steal from you, but how dare I be stolen from, from my, from the, the wealth that I have garnered from stealing from others. Right, and that's really what this is about, and it, and people are looking at it in the the completely wrong way. People are looking at it as completely on 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 uh, uh, tax evasion, and that's not what this is about. It's tax evasion, right? I mean, 
with this, we'll conclude that uh, there's not enough taxation is that means out there yet. So right. we gotta <laughs> keep ramping them up. It's just about having there being a double standard. Some one person says, "Hey, I'm gonna take from you, and you're not gonna take from me," even though he tries to convince everyone, "Oh, we should all take from each other, guys." All right. Absolutely. It's like, oh, when it comes to me, you know. All right. So this kind of goes into the next story we're gonna talk about in terms of how to. Uh, other ways to kind of emancipate yourself from tyranny. So there was a message that was sent from Anonymous J. He says, uh, I fully agree with your move to spread anarchy. It's inevitable, uh, the outcome of personal freedom. I've watched over many, many videos on spreading anarchy. Awesome. On uh, school campuses, public sidewalks, etc. My favorite is the one that included the humiliation of the police officer student to tell, to tell me where I can't physically stand and cannot stand to express freedom of speech. Um, he says, I'm, I've been an anarchist for almost a year now, but a bunch of these liberating videos have really opened me up. Of course, the propaganda fueled tyrannical hit person off his claim that anarchy is chaotic and full of destruction, but you've helped me realize that it's meant to be love and unviolent. Absolutely. The essence of anarchy is consent. However, they, it doesn't say that, um, it doesn't say, we're in love to destroy the government buildings that own slaves, operate theft schemes, and plan international genocide. Well, I don't know about how that part fits in. Or of genocide of government. Uh, speaking to the public and using voice can sometimes be more effective and highly respected. I understand your frustration towards the government controlling your every move and telling us what to do with their own bodies and using the threat of violence to enforce their laws against civilians of this country. I have a few questions regarding the practice of anarchy that I would like to help help with. But I'll start with my main question: how do we actually emancipate ourselves from all government? And not to not be part of their dictatorship anymore. Anonymous J. Um, well, in this particular situation that we we're talking about, like earlier with the Panama Papers, a way to emancipate yourself from like the monetary controls of uh, currency that these banks hold in conjunction with government, would be Bitcoin. Bypassing. Right. So how many currency is is optimal? Cryptocurrency is the uh, revolutionary technology of our age. And, and um, I would argue that Bitcoin may not necessarily be the one, although it has, right now it has the market adoption, but uh, any cryptocurrency, if you can get into it, you know, go for it. it um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dash, you know, go into these technologies because these are the future. And they are the way that we will have to escape the, this, this overarching tyranny that we have been dealing with for, for years. Right, we went to a brewery uh, recently where they accept Bitcoin for beer. And uh, we were just talking about uh, board games and stuff like that. And conversations that come up about uh, like playing poker, right? Because it, it reminded me of a story that happened in uh, Nova, Northern Virginia, in which these people were playing with several thousand dollars, and the cops found out that people are playing, you know, consensually with, with their own property, and that's not permissible. Sorry, uh, you owe us money if you're going to play games, and so during the money was stolen, and people were throwing a jail time. However, they had used Bitcoin, and the police extortionists came in. There would be nothing for them to vote for. <laughs> Where's your Bitcoin? Where's your Bitcoin? We, we are here to <laughs> confiscate. Physical monies, where are your Bitcoin? Right. They're here somewhere. Somewhere, somewhere. It's like the TSA story a couple, a couple of years ago where they went to this guy who was trying to board a plane and it's like, we know you got Bitcoin in your luggage. Where's your Bitcoin? Show it to me. We, 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 we know you got it in there. Come on, bring it out. I know you're hiding it in there. I was like, stop, where are you going? <laughs> Here's all my stuff. Look for it. Look through it all you want. Right. See if find you whatever Bitcoin see you find. Right. Bitcoin. Right. You can print out Bitcoin. Uh, it's also a way to kind of produce Bitcoin to be tangible, but at the same time, uh, it's digital. So uh, it's a way to kind of protect your assets from like would-be thieves that are out there. Um, in terms of a business uh, expediency, there's no processing payment days that you wait for you to receive the value. So as you mentioned, yeah, Bitcoin is definitely revolutionized the way we exchange uh, value, and the same way the internet ex revolutionized the way we exchange messages. So uh, I want to actually correct you there. So, so this actually goes into currency competition. So currency competition is one of the best things about a, 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 uh, an open free market. And uh, one of the things about Bitcoin is it has an issue that it actually does not have immediate um, confirmation of, of transactions. So Bitcoin actually takes at least 10 minutes to 
uh, fully confirm a, a transaction, sometimes more than that, depending on how, um, how traffic uh, is going on the network. And um, one of the things that, one of the reasons why people have actually been, uh, people in the know, so to speak, have been actually uh, switching from Bitcoin to things like Dash and Ethereum is because Dash, Dash actually has very, very fast transactions, much faster than Bitcoin uh, has itself. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the one of the great things about currency uh, competition. Uh, or, sorry, currency competition that we have in uh, in the crypto sphere is that you know we have all of these other things popping up like you know Dash and Ethereum and Litecoin and, and things like that that have various um, you know uh, various things that are that are better than than other. And, and Bitcoin, right now, the main thing behind Bitcoin is just the, the market acceptance, the market, you know, the market drive. Bitcoin has, you know, at least twice the market acceptance than, than just about any other coin. But Ethereum is really driving up on it fast. And Ethereum is, is really picking up there. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm sure uh, there will be a lot of competition for maybe the silver standard, for the mm -hmm. Bitcoin's gold standard, maybe eventually they'll replace the gold standard at some point. I don't know. But I guess in terms of um, expediting the fall of fiat currency, my big support has always been uh, behind Bitcoin first, behind before yeah. other currencies, right? To put the marketability first, uh, digital currency, this, I feel like pushing for Bitcoin, since it really has a large market share, and then the abolition of the state and everything else, yeah, that everything, whatever, you know, let the chips fall where they may as any other commodity or product. Mm -hmm. so, um, I feel like to emancipate, one of the first steps you can take, that you can all take to emancipate ourselves from these fascist systems, is to engage in markets where they're not wealthy. So engage in adverse markets. Like, Bitcoin's one way of transferring wealth. But I mean, this, the concept of bartering, trading one thing for another where you can, that's also another way of bypassing, uh, of bypassing tra transferring the wealth. Like right now, the way the fiat currencies we use and the banking systems that we have in place, it's controlled and, and controlled and stipulated and manipulated by those the, by the governments that are in power, as we can clearly see by the banks that are in collusion through the Panama Papers. So, what marketplaces are out there that we can use to get outside of? To get outside of these captive markets, because we, we most people live in captive markets, and they have to use fiat currency because that's the only market that they really have to their exposure. Well, the great thing about Bitcoin is, is that Bitcoin has been um, very, very much a facilitator of escaping, uh, escaping oppressive regimes. So uh, China has used Bitcoin for capital flight, at, you know, to to escape. The uh, the oppressive um, uh, monetary um, controls that China has, uh, Venezuela has has come, uh, it has become a, a big uh, Bitcoin proponent. A, a lot of people in Venezuela that have have tried to escape that seriously dis disruptively oppressive um, socialist regime regime that they have there. Uh, a lot of people that. Um, there have used Bitcoin to escape that. Yes. People in uh, Brazil, Brazil has become a big uh, Bitcoin base. So it's it's it, uh, Bitcoin itself as a as a market driver. That's one of the, the biggest things going forward. Has been a huge escape route for people in these most oppressive governments. And frankly, right now, it is a huge escape driver for people escaping the gigantically oppressive growth of the American government, which is, is has just been growing beyond compare. Uh, and, and just taking you know taking over the the, the personal lives and the, and the financial lives and everything of the people in, in America. And Bitcoin has been a huge way of, uh, for people to escape, especially, yeah. and you know, I, I hate to, to make this, this sort of shout out, but especially in New Hampshire. You know, New Hampshire, a lot of people have been using Bitcoin, and that's one of the, the biggest Bitcoin bases 
And uh, also, I'm proud to say in, in Richmond, a lot of people have, have been using Bitcoin in Richmond. So I've met like probably 400 people, Bitcoin users here in Richmond already. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, we have a brewery, we have two breweries now, Resistance Brewery and Triple Crossing that accepts Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, you can buy jewelry in Williamsburg, like 20 miles away, and there's like massage service in Short Pump area for Bitcoin. Really? Uh, that's, yeah, that's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everywhere I go, everywhere I go in town, I make sure to ask them, do you accept Bitcoin or, or do you accept cryptocurrency? Because I, I want to make sure to spread this. And this is really the way that we escape this, yes. you know, this, this the matrix. Right. Yeah, we escape the matrix through through using, and that's one of the things that 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 pops up all the time is this, you know, cashless society. This is be be afraid of the cashless uh, cashless society because this is the ultimate tyranny. And to me, it's no screw cash. Get rid of cash. Go away from cash. Go to Bitcoin. Use a cashless society in our own. Uh, our, our own way. Right, like a, a DVD-less society where we can just stream videos. Right, right? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, a VHS-less society? Right, exactly. <laughs> the, the, DVD, the DVD-less society is the, is the video, you know, the video yeah. patriarch or whatever. But at the same time, yeah, screw that. We're going to use BitTorrent and we're going yeah. to watch our own DVDs. It's been a long time since I've ever bought a DVD. So right, uh, exactly. For years now. Um, there's a lot of different ways to, to achieve freedom and emancipate, and that's something that we can continue to talk through like, uh, for, like for eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, a great one to, to carry away with would be Bitcoin. Um, next time we'll, we'll talk about a different version of way to achieve uh, freedom, but Bitcoin's a great place, especially towards our uh, financial needs, you know, in terms of uh, protecting your the productivity you create, that creates happiness for you. When you work over 100 days a year to hand it over to your slave master, it'd be great to kind of Keep back some of those days for yourself. Yeah, out of a hundred days of work, you have to give up about twenty-five of those to a slave master. And yeah. it, how is that anything other than slavery? At, at the very least, serfdom. Serfdom was, by definition, about fifteen to twenty-five percent of your labor goes to the uh, to the lords, right? You know, of your of your kingdom, right? And the bitcoins, like, well, where's the bitcoins? Like, well, go for it, check it out. Yeah, well, yeah. uh, what's the so Grab what you can. Right? <laughs> Grab what you can. <laughs> But you know, uh, another another perfect way that this this uh, that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is being used to sort of circumvent the uh, circumvent the um the the current system. Recently, a so-called killer app has come out for Bitcoin, and it's called Open Bazaar. And this is something that I have been just. So excited about this is this is one of my favorite things to happen in in the recent years, and it's called um, so uh, a recent blog came out. Open Bazaar is open for business. They have officially they have officially come out with their their um, non beta official uh, uh, program. So what is Open Bazaar? Open so Open Bazaar is is essentially the the BitTorrent for markets. So uh, the BitTorrent for storefronts, and and what you do is is you just you know it's it's like eBay except uh, decentralized. It's it's an amazing concept. So um, a, a few things that you have to make sure to uh, sort of uh, uh, keep keep track of. So so Open Bazaar like Bitcoin is not inherently anonymous. But it, it is sort of the answer to this um, this uh, centralization that that uh, that makes you vulnerable to attack from from you know uh, say you know the American government or right. uh, one of the one of the most uh, one of the biggest examples of political cr uh, prisoners in our age is um, uh, the founder of uh, Silk Road. Yeah. Ah. And, Russ Ulbricht. Right, Russ Ulbricht. And he is, he is, in my mind, one of the biggest heroes of our age. And, 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 and as it stands, one of the biggest martyrs of our age. And Open Bazaar is sort of an answer to the way that he got caught. You know, he got caught because, essentially because of centralization. Right. And Open Bazaar just decentralizes that, that online market. And you can accept Bitcoin, you can accept dollars, you can accept, you know, whatever. 
but you have this, you, you open your, um, client? your storefront, right, your client, you, you open your storefront on this network in a, a sort of bit turn, uh, BitTorrent uh, distri distributed way, and um, you can sell stuff, you can sell stuff, sell stuff, ship stuff if you want to sell digital, uh, digital um, products, that's fine. Or you can sell, you know, people are already selling weed. People are already selling drugs. Right, yeah, the first day, it, it, the first day, it, the day that it actually came out, people were, were immediately selling drugs, which is great, yeah. Um, but you can sell, uh, you can sell whatever you want, from wherever you want, to wherever you want, in this distributed marketplace, you can accept Bitcoin, you can accept dollars, whatever you want. I think the decentralized portion of it is awesome because uh, there have been some other interesting markets, dark net markets, in which uh, they will exist for a couple of months, for a year, and then all of a sudden you know, yeah. it will shut down and people just disappear, right? It right. Kind of a, uh, Bitcoin that they forget to put on escrow and they run their accounts and just kind of clean up shop and, and go. Right, Mount Gox. Uh, Mount Gox ran for a little while. Yeah. Cut out, stole a whole bunch of people, people's money. All right. Uh, uh, the Silk Road ran for a while, got raided, completely cut out. A whole bunch of people got uh, got uh, uh, indicted. For that. Right. Uh, Silk Road Two. I don't really know what's going on with that. Uh, but probably the same thing. But uh, not to say like this happens only in the markets. This happens in government as well, right? So like, so security, they stole the money, you're not going to see any of that? Like, no, this, this, this happens solely in the, in the, in the government-run uh, situation. Right. All of this stuff is, is because of, of government, uh, government intrusion right. in the market. Right. You know, this stuff, I mean, it, it can happen on a smaller scale in, in, a, in an open market. You know, let's, let's not pretend that anything is a utopia, but the, to the extent that it happens now, that is facilitated by government involvement. You know, it, and, and it even goes to the the point of uh, the banks and, and right. the the uh, the pyramid schemes that go on. Those are really facilitated by by government involvement. The banks would not be too big for uh, to fail if the government wasn't bailing them out to, to begin with. Right. <laughs> Uh, the war on drugs and all that stuff, and uh, making a, these kind of particular devices illegal means that it's difficult to find arbitration. So these kind of markets have, uh, in a way, helped to reduce significantly uh, the violence that you would have had seen otherwise, and people trying to trade outside of that. Because uh, when people talk about, well, what's going to really regulate these drugs and certain sort of things? Well, it's difficult to regulate things when it's illegal in the first place to kind of trace back a product to its producer or owner or whoever selling it. Um, but the markets in itself have produced their own kind of. Uh, Regulatory contingency in its way too as well. You have a lot of people just like an eBay, Etsy, rain products, commentary, and, and, and the industry and there's still like standards. Yeah, there's absolutely. industry standards. Like this, all oh, that already exists for illicit drugs. With weed, you have different kinds of strains. And people know how strong a certain thing is. These standards will come about. People will be the clients. People buying these things will end up being the ones who judge what standards work and which ones don't. Right. And that's the only regulation you really need. Right. right. The term, you know, outside of the drug market, the, the term best practices it exists for a reason. You know, this is not a government dictated term. Best practices is a is a, a market yes. uh, learned situation. It's like, hey, you know, we want to do things right. We want to make sure things are right because if we don't, if we screw up, we're going to lose money. Yeah. I don't have a right to customers. Exactly. <laughs> I don't have a right to money or what's in your pockets. Whereas government was dictating say, oh, hold on, hold on. The government is here. You do have the right to customers, <laughs> and we will make sure that is that is here for you. And we will, you know, we will raise the minimum wage to, you know, knock out all of all of the other, you know, non-skilled employees that they are. They will make right. that cake. <laughs> <laughs> you will make that cake. So apparently, the, uh, the owner, the creator, one one of the people who were able to create this stuff was in Michigan. So they are in touch with the our, our fellow friends in Michigan, and uh, yeah. run into it because apparently he's uh, he's into anarchy. I guess we kind of ran into it for a little bit, did we not? At the at the conference in DC. Who are you talking about? Uh, the guy who created uh, um, Elder Bazaar. 
Oh, I didn't run it. Oh, maybe. Maybe it was just me on my way back up. And we just had no, the only person he was there. Yeah, the only person our guy was there was talking about cryptocurrency and I asked him the question. He's like, yeah, I'm very into um, really? I didn't have it recorded. Are you, are you talking about Chris Messina? Or? Uh, he, he's the only person I know who was involved. Well, there was one person at the conference who was giving a talk on it. And I built your currency and he's all into anarcho capitalism and everything. And uh, I just, I think I met him just outside of the elevator and just kind of talking. He had this shirt, Open Bazaar, on it. And I was like, hey, Open Bazaar, love it. I've been following that stuff for quite some time. Like, uh, yeah. and it's like, it's kind of not so much that it's been delayed, like a dark wallet, but this is one like this kind of, you know, sticking through for a while and finally came out, which is great. Dark wallet is another topic for another conversation, but it's uh, right. Yeah, different. dark wallet is a good one. Well, the uh, I think the developers of dark wallet went on to develop Dash, something else, right? Which was uh, Dash was originally dark coin, right? And it's right. a it's a private, it's kind of a private and um, instant transaction version of Bitcoin, right? But it, it, it it's a um, it's sort of a branch off of Litecoin, which which was originally a fork off of uh, right. Bitcoin. So there's a lot of uh, good stuff out there to look into. Open Bazaar, uh, the place where we're talking about uh, the panel of papers, right? It's like, yeah, but who's anyone? You know, you know, a couple of people are going to come and eventually to hide your money. Uh, hiding money underneath your bed mattress is also tax evasion, right? Uh, evasion of thieves and murderers. And so, if you have any questions for us to kind of go over or any topics for us to discuss or examine, um, please send us our way. And with that, so this is uh, Campbell Lane. Here's on Flores. I'm Phil Butler. See you guys at the Victory Party. Take good care.